Uh, what a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord at a live Wesleyan church. We welcome you and let's stand and lift our praises to our Lord and Savior this morning. downstairs following the second service this week a lot of the things are going on youth group tonight at 5 30 to 7 30 so youth and teens take note of that wig on tuesday at 10 o'clock and then prayer meeting uh this wednesday at seven o'clock pastor Larry is going to be starting a new study uh in case you haven't got enough of the book of philippians he's going to look at paul's prayer there in philippians chapter one so a brand new study looking at paul's prayer on philippians chapter one uh throughout the summer we still have house churches going on uh, as I said last week, uh, or the week before, some house churches are taking a break through the summer, but I know there's at least five that are still going on, uh, so just take note of that. We want to encourage you to continue to attend house churches. There are camps in your bulletin's list of Chambers Camp. Uh, my family was just at Chambers the week before for family camp, but there are still camps going on throughout the summer. There's a virtual kids camp coming up soon. Uh, but one sad thing is that uh, men's retreat was canceled this year, so there is no men's retreat. Uh, they just said that got canceled. So no, no men's retreat this year. We are continuing to work on our directory. So there's a form in the front and back of the church uh, where you can sign up for the directory. Uh, make sure your information is correct. And also July 31st is the last day to renew your membership. So if you're a member of the church and you need to renew that, July 31st is the last day to renew that. 
All right, let's start off with a word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you as we come to your house this morning. Father, we do thank you for the Lord, this Lord's Day. This is a day you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for this morning all that will happen. We pray for your blessings over us up here, for the kids as they go downstairs in a few minutes. We thank you for the celebration of new members that will take into the church. We thank you for uh, a church picnic that we can celebrate the fellowship together. Father, help us as we pray, as we sing, as we open up your word, Lord. Father, we just give this time over to you and all that you want to accomplish through it. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As we said earlier this morning, we're going to recognize new members. And if you look in your bulletin, there are eight new members that are joining the Live Wesleyan Church. Some are in this service and some are in second service. Um, I'm going to call all their names out. If you hear your name, if you want to come up front here, we want to recognize you. Uh, but Alan and Mackenzie, you guys want to come up front? And then uh, Valerie Coe, which I think attends second service, or will be in second service. Lou, who does moment. Sarah and Scott Eplin, who attend second service. Michelle Frazier. And my brother Stephen Passions. So we're going to have each of them give a speech. <laughs> you guys can come over more this way. You lose Mackenzie as she comes. <laughs> Alright. Well, it's, uh, it's a great and exciting thing to be able to receive new members into the church, especially if you think about where churches have been over the last two years. Um, what a blessing it is to be able to have these new members that have joined our church. And what is amazing is just the different stories of how God has brought each of them into our church body. Right? Each of them have an amazing testimony of why they're here. Um, and just a, a powerful story. Each of them have, have blessed me and refreshed me in a way of being part of this church. So let me say thank you to each of you for being here and being a part of the church. So, Dear friends, the privileges and blessings which, ha which we have within the fellowship of the church of Jesus Christ are sacred and precious. Christ so loved the church that he gave himself for it, sanctifying himself that the church might be sanctified. He chose to speak of himself as the head of the church and the church as his body. Again, he spoke of himself as a husband, the church as his bride. Christ gave himself unselfishly, and he asked the church to share in his glorious relationship with all humankind, sending it out into the world to preach the scriptures, to save the lost, to administer the sacraments, to maintain Christian fellowship and discipline, and to build up the believer until he comes again. All of us, whatever our age or position, stand in need of Christ's church, and of those means of grace which it alone makes available. It is in keeping with Christ's command, commission to the church that we meet together now. There are some among us who testify to having been received already into the spiritual fellowship of the universal church and who desire to receive its official and visible fellowship of this local unit of the body of Christ at a live Wesleyan church. These people standing before you this morning come to enter into a covenant as members of the Wesleyan Church with all the accompanying rights, privileges, responsibilities. They testify to have been born again. They have received the sacrament of baptism. They have been instructed in and have accepted the doctrine and polity of the Wesleyan Church, have been approved by the vote of the manifesting of the Spirit and the practice of God's work of grace within their hearts. Now to you four. By coming before us today, you indicate your purpose to publicly confess the Lord Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be your God and the object of your highest love. You accept the Lord Jesus to be your Redeemer, the Holy Spirit to be your Sanctifier, Comforter, and Guide. You joyfully dedicate yourselves to God within the everlasting covenant of His grace, that you might be used in His service to glorify and honor Him. And you promise to hold to Him as the highest good of your lives, that you will give diligent attention to the commandments and principles of His Word, that you will seek the honor and advancement of His kingdom, that you'll forsake all ungodliness and worldly desires, and you'll live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You do also purpose to join yourselves to this church, submitting yourselves to its principles and government by walking in love and fellowship with all its members, seeking its peace, purity, and growth in grace. Do you freely and sincerely devote yourselves to be the Lord's within the fellowship of this church? If so, say, I do. Amen. Well, the next part is for you, 
as the live Wesleyan Church. May the members of this church now join me in welcoming these new ones into our fellowship, assuring them of our love, our prayers, of our care over them all the days to come. Do you, the members of this church, receive these into our communion and fellowship as beloved brothers and sisters, promise to walk with them in love, to instruct, counsel, admonish, and cherish them, and to watch over them with all long suffering, gentleness, and love. If so say, we do. We do. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God of the church, we thank you for the blessings of Christian fellowship, for the joining together in one body all those who truly believe in Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you for these today that are becoming part of this local church, the branch of Christ's body. Grant to them the grace and strength that they shall need to fulfill their vows and bind our hearts together in your holy love that we may aid each other and that together we may share your gospel with the world for which Christ died. In his name we pray, amen. amen. Now on behalf of this local Wesleyan church and the body of Christ, I extend the right hand of fellowship and welcome you to a live Wesleyan church. Give a big round of applause. Now, Lou, you can't go away so quick. Lou has special music for us this morning. So Lou's going to bring us special music this morning on the hammered dulcimer. And it's the hymn, In the Garden. Thou shalt I. Thou shalt I. El Shaddai. I'll get it eventually. So look. Thank you, Lou. Well, this time I'll release the kids. You guys want to head down to Sunday school? And as they're heading down, we want to have a time of prayer to lift up one another, to praise together, to celebrate, and also to lift up those that, that need prayer this morning. So any prayer requests or praises or testimonies someone might have this morning? Claire. Um, I know I asked Larry to put on a prayer chain of Colleague's mother, Jeanette Rice, we've been praying for. Um, she had aggressive brain cancer. She passed away. So within two months of diagnosis, she. So just prayers for her, her family. Peace. All right. So the family of Jeanette Rice passed away from brain cancer. Anybody else this morning? Praise or prayer request they'd like lifted up? Yep. Had blood drain from his brain, and 
they he's on the floor to try to learn to walk again. He just turned 86 while he was in the hospital. But my prayer is for the families because it's hard for them to see him in the hospital. So they want him to walk enough to come home. All right. So Gail's sister-in-law, Debbie Smith's father, <coughs> healing for him, be able to recover enough to be able to get back home. Michael? She lift up Joe and Natalie. Most of you got the email. Joe's um, son, Zach, passed away of a tragic accident this week. So the calling hours are Tuesday from 4 to 6 at Sheps, and they're going to have a memorial service after that. So let's lift up Joe and Natalie. Mark? Unspoken. Are there other unspokens this morning? All right. Uh, Pastor, I'd like to lift up Roger Duterte, who we got some devastating news this week about the cancer is there, and they're going to have to try to treat it. Okay. Uh, let's lift up Roger Duterte, who got the results from his test, and they did find cancer. <laughs> So we're going to have to treat Roger, so let's pray for him. Anybody else this morning? Amen. Amen. Good to have you back, Grace. Anybody else? All right. All right, let's go to Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we come before you again this morning in this time of prayer. Lord, we praise you for who you are. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for your grace that is new to us each morning. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity it is to come and speak to you, the precious privilege it is to come to our God in prayer. Father, help us, even as we begin, begin prayer this morning, just to recognize just how sweet it is to be able to come before you and to share what's on our hearts. That in this life there may be things that feel overwhelming to us, things too big for us to deal with, struggles that no one even knows about that we are dealing with, Lord, but we can come before the God of the universe. The psalmist says, where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of the heavens and the earth. He will not be moved. So Father, we thank you that we can come to you this morning. Whether in joy and celebration about what you are doing to give testimony, or bent over over the burden of obstacles in our way, things that have happened to us, things that have bruised us throughout this week. We thank you, Lord, that we come to you, a loving God. Father, this morning as we praise you and thank you for what you are doing. We thank you for these new members. Father, I thank you for each of these new members that we received in the church this morning. I thank you for Alan McKenzie being up here and their testimony and for bringing them into this family of God. The story that you have written in their lives and just, Lord, how they have ministered to this church. We thank you for them and for their being a part of this family. We thank you for Lou. We thank you for the journey he has been on, Lord, for the testimonies he has shared, Lord. We thank you for the man of God that you have made him. And we just thank you for bringing him into this family. May that you continue to bless him. We thank you for Michelle and for her family, Lord. We thank you for her being here. And Lord, we thank you for saving her and bringing her into this church, Father. We thank you for her testimony. And may this church come alongside of her. May each of us walk alongside of one another on our spiritual journey. We thank you for these four and the four that will be in second service, Father. And may your blessings just rest upon them as they walk with you, O Lord. Father, this morning, we thank you for grace being here this morning. Lord, after the, the journey she's been on, Father, for the, the medical problems she's been facing, we thank you, Lord, for her being here, for your strength and recovery, for your healing upon her. Lord, we just continue to ask for your strength and protection over grace. Father God, this morning our, our prayers go up for those that are hurting, that need a touch from you. Father, this morning we, we lift up the family of, of Claire's co-worker, Janet Rice, after her passing. 
Father, we pray for your comfort and your help for those that are grieving and mourning. Pray that you'd be close to them and help them. Father, we just pray for your, your great comfort as a God of all mercies to be with them that are hurting this morning. May you just help that family and be close to them. And Father, this morning we lift up uh, Debbie Smith's father. We pray for healing for him, Lord, that he may recover the ability to walk and be strengthened and be able to get out of the hospital and get back home. Pray for your healing touch upon his legs and his entire body, Father. Bring healing to him, Lord. We ask for your great touch upon him. Father God, this morning our, our prayers go up for Joe and Natalie as well after the passing of Zach. Father, we pray you be close to them and help comfort them. Father, we pray that you'll be with them throughout this week for, for plans, for the calling hours, the memorial service, the graveside service. Father, just pray for your healing touch, for your very real presence to be there, to be close to the brokenhearted. Just ask that you'll be there with Joe and just help him, give him strength and all that he needs for him. Father, this morning we want to lift up our brother Roger to you. Father, we pray for Roger after this diagnosis of cancer. Lord, that you will be there with Roger. Father, we know that what is impossible with man is possible with you. So, Father, as this church family, we gather around Roger. We pray for your healing touch upon him, Lord. The Father, that you who knit Roger together in his mother's womb is also the same God who can bring healing and victory over this cancer. So, Father, we would pray that you would do just that, that you would heal Roger, that you would remove this cancer, that you'd be with him, give him and Helen peace and strength as they go through this. Father, may we be found faithful in prayer for our brother. We lift him up to you this morning. And Father, finally, we lift up one another with the unspoken request of hands that were raised, Father, that you will come alongside those that need, need a friend, those who need someone for healing, for, for those who need a financial help, to those that just are reaching out to you this morning for whatever their issue is, Father. We come alongside them as the family of God. Father, as we testified to just a, a few minutes ago through the membership, that we, as members of this church, are committed to lifting one another up. Help us to be faithful in that vow, Lord. So, Father, we lift one another up. We continue to lift our country up and pray that you will give our leaders wisdom, bring healing to our country. Father, we recognize that you are the only hope we have, so we lift our, our questions, our troubles, our burdens up to you this morning. Father, we thank you for this time of prayer, and we lift all this up in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Some ask the praise team to come back up. stand as we continue our worship this morning.
doesn't matter what's going on, our God is in control of everything.
chapter 1, we're going to pick up where we left off two weeks ago, Philippians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 27, really just look at these first four verses, uh, but we'll read Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, to chapter 2, verse 11. Philippians, for the end of your Bible, end of the New Testament, towards it, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, let's hear God's word together. Apostle Paul writes, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now hear in me. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there is any comfort of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. Taking on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God 
the Father. God bless that passage as we look at it together. Now it's good to be back in the pulpit this morning after not being able to preach last week. I want to thank Pastor Larry for his excellent message on 1 John chapter 4 about loving one another. It's a blessing to know that the church is in good hands even when I'm not up here. But it was good to be at family camp last week and to teach the, the daily Bible class. But it's always good to be back with you at a, a live Wesleyan church and bring the message to you this morning. And interestingly, last time when we were in Philippians, we, Paul talked about the different motives men had for preaching the gospel. We looked at verses 15 through 18. It's interesting that when I a family camp and you talk to different pastors, that, that some pastors share that they are pastors because they, they like to shepherd or... Others like to lead, they have that gift, and they, they preach because it's part of the job description. But they feel their actual calling and gifting is another fact of ministry. They, they preach because they are pastors. But for me, if I'm honest, some aspects of being a pastor drain me more than others, but I always enjoy preaching. That part doesn't drain me, at least when I'm, when I'm here with you. So it's good to be able to beg me back up here to see your smiling faces. And it's good this morning to be able to celebrate that this is a special Sunday in our church, right? To, to bring new members into our church. I even I wore my Wesleyan socks for this special occasion. I could break out when we bring Wesleyans into the church. And it's great to be able to welcome Alan McKenzie and Scott and Sarah and Valerie and Lou and Michelle and my, my brother Stephen. And, and for those of you who are members of the Wesleyan Church, you know that there's a, a process to it. There's a, a process to become a member, right? There's classes you take, there's interviews, you're uh, to be baptized, you have to, we hear your testimony that being part of the local church is something that is important. I teach in that membership class that when you accept Jesus Christ at any time in your life, you join the, the universal church, the church with a, a capital C, but then as you join a local church, you become part of a, a local body a local family, and how precious that is. And when we receive new members, as we did this morning, the, the first line there in the, the Wesleyan discipline, as you receive members, says this, Dear friends, the privileges and blessings which we have within the fellowship of the Church of Jesus Christ are sacred and precious. And that sounds great, right? Privileges and blessings, right? Who doesn't want those? And we, we talk about what those are, right? You, as a member, you get to vote at the annual meeting. You get exciting things like to approve the budget. You can vote the pastor in. You can vote the pastor out, right? You can serve as a Sunday school teacher. Why? You can use the pavilion for a birthday party. You can borrow tables and chairs. According to discipline, you can even have the right for the church to perform your funeral. That certainly is a perk. <laughs> Maybe not a perk for you so much, but for your next of kin, maybe the new members didn't even know how lucky they were as they came into the church. But we've talked a, a lot about membership lately, because this is the time of year after the annual meeting when people renew their annual renewal of their membership, and so we've talked to people about renewing their membership. And some people have asked, well, well why should I be a member? Why, why should I retain my membership, right? If it's if it's just about voting and you're going to ask me to serve, then I don't know. But there's certainly a, a call to fellowship, right? There's certainly a call to be part of a, a family together. And some want to know, well, what are, the, what are the benefits of being a member of the church? And that's a, a good question. Like I said, we start by receiving members with that phrase, right? Dear friends, the privileges and blessings here within the fellowship of the church of Jesus Christ are very sacred and precious. But then I, I come to this passage, and I, I want you to look in your Bibles with me at Philippians 1.29 that we read a second ago. And, and Paul writes this to that church and the, the members of that church. And what does he write? For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And, and I'm struck by this idea. I, I want you to look at that verse. Paul writes, it has been granted to you as Christians... First, to believe. Well, well that's good news. Right? Ephesians 2, 8-9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Paul writes at the end of Romans 12, 3, 
God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. Right? We, we get that. Believe. The church here in Philippi was founded on that very word. Right? You remember back to the, the Philippian jailer. Right? He said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what was Paul and Silas' answer? Anybody remember? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your house. Right? When we go through membership, guess what? We focus on what people believe. Right? We ask them, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? Do you believe what self, you know, what do you believe about salvation? Do you have any questions about theology, the Wesleyan Church? Right? We, we go through all of these beliefs, and we don't normally have a problem there. But here's the trouble. Guess what? The, the verse doesn't end there with believe. What does it say? But to you has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Not only to believe in Him, but also to what? Suffer. Suffer. Suffer for His sake, right? How many of us are willing to sign up for that part? Are we willing to suffer? We're, we're willing to believe in Jesus, but are we willing to also suffer him for Him, whatever that might entail? The sermon this morning, the, the title and the truth of this idea comes from J.D. Walt, who's at Asbury Seminary, and, and he calls this the gospel in two grand movements. The gospel in two grand movements. And that's, that's where we find ourselves this morning. I'd like to say that I strategically planned it this morning because for these new members and for you who renewed your membership, it is too late for you, right? You've already signed on the dotted line. It's too late to go back now. Ironically, we don't focus on these verses when it comes to preparing people for membership in the church. Right? We don't normally emphasize the suffering part. We found it's tougher to get people to become members that way. But as you come to the last four verses in Philippians 1, Warren Warsby calls this section battle stations. Right? He writes that your Christian life is not so much a, a playground as it is a battleground. And he sees these three analogies in the first chapter of Philippians. And if you kind of look on the back of your bulletin, I wrote them out there for you. You can go through them. Right? He, we looked at these in week one and week two of the sermon series where we were. He says, we are sons in the family enjoying the fellowship of the gospel. That's Philippians 1 through 11 that we looked at in the very first week of the sermon. Then he says, we are servants sharing in the furtherance of the gospel in verses 12 through 26. So we're, we're sons enjoying fellowship in the gospel. Then we are servants in the furtherance of the gospel. And then we come to this last section. He says we are now soldiers defending the faith of the gospel. It's a call to stand fast, right? If you think back to where we were last time we were in Philippians, Philippians 1.21 says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? He, he's calling us to be fully Live fully for Christ, right? Surrendered, sanctified lives as a servant. But then he, he ups the ante and he starts talking about becoming soldiers. In verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come to you and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And what I want you to see is that there is a, a, a intended natural evolution in walking with Jesus, right? That there, there should be a progression, right? He says you start off and you are sons and daughters, right? You're, you're adopted into the family of God. But we aren't meant to stay there. He says, no, now we're called to serve. From sons and daughters to servants. And, and some people never get there. Right? Some people will spend their entire lives and they will stay consumers of the church. Right? What is the church going to do for me? How is the church going to meet my needs? How is God going to meet my needs? We don't serve. But Paul writes, we come to the kingdom of God as sons and daughters. We grow and we progress and we become servants. But then he calls us to mature even more. And he says, now I want you to be soldiers who defend the faith. Well, that might sound scary. What's the first and foremost way you're going to defend the faith? Well, it's probably not going to be by having an apologetics debate. It's probably not going to be by having an argument on Facebook. 
No, he, he says the first and foremost way is it's by your life. The way that you live and the way that you act. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Have you ever thought about that? The, the way you live will demonstrate the gospel, the God you believe. But it's also interesting that he speaks to the church not just as uh, just as you would to a soldier. That he says you are not alone in isolation, right? This is not a one-man crusade or a, a one-woman crusade. He stresses to stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, right? He's talking about us doing it in community. And, and then he gives us this encouragement. And not in any way terrified by your adversary. Which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. Right? How much does the church need to hear today that we're not to be terrified of our adversaries? Right? How much does a Christian need to be stop being so afraid? Yes, we're called to stand fast, to work together, but he also encourages us not to be afraid of our opponents. Yes, there are battles, but God has won the war. So the Apostle Paul writes, be together, fight the battle, don't be afraid. But then after all that, he comes to this verse where we began, Philippians 1.29. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time for the rest of this message. And I tell you, there's a truth that, that far too many Christians will kind of ignore this deep revelation in this verse. As J.D. Wall calls it, the, two, the gospel in two grand movements, believing and suffering. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Right? As you read that, what do you think it even means? Right? We often spend so much effort to get people to believe that we fail to talk about the second half, to prepare them for suffering. But there's a progression in our faith. Right? He who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. The gospel comes in these two grand movements. And I, I want us this morning to take some time to see it and, and to understand it. Believing and becoming. And, and if you read the whole rest of the book of Philippians, this is where Paul is going to kind of stay. And this is what Paul spends the whole rest of the letter on, basically. J.D. Wall wrote, The gospel comes in two massive movements, believing and becoming. And he writes this, We believe in Jesus, and then we become like Jesus. Christ suffered on our behalf and He grants us the gift of suffering on His behalf. We must learn, though, what Jesus means by suffering. He says it is quite simple. Suffering in the vision of the Gospel means love. Right? We think back to Pastor Larry's sermon from last week. And it's kind of neat. Walt sees the first half of the Gospel flowing from John 3.16. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? We, we know that part. But then he says the second half of the gospel, perhaps serendipitously, issues from 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. You know, as you, if you take time and you read the book of Philippians, you'll quickly realize that it's not a book intended to share the gospel. Right? It's, not a, it's not a letter or a book of the Bible that emphasis on you accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Paul is not writing to people who don't know who Jesus is. He is writing to the church and saying, okay, now is time for you not only to believe in Jesus, but to become like Jesus. The second grand movement of the Gospel. And that's exactly what he starts talking about in Philippians 2. Right, we, we'll look at that in depth next week as we look through the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 2. But friends, why at a live Wesleyan church do we encourage people to be a part of house church? Right? Why is that part of our vision to say, hey, we want everybody to participate in a house church? Or, or why do we emphasize and invest in one-on-one -on -one discipleship and mentoring and Sunday school classes and Bible studies and prayer meeting? Because our vision is to help people become like Jesus Christ. You know, our country is so dominated by easy believism. Right? And this is the part where I'll get myself in trouble. 
But churches can focus a lot on people getting saved, and that's a good thing. But many, many, too many times we neglect the second part. The suffering part is a tough sell, isn't it? Someone once asked C.S. Lewis, why do the righteous suffer? His answer was, why not? They're the only ones who can take it. But the American church can be dominated by a consumer mentality, right? We, we don't want to suffer, right, in any form. The AC is out, we stay home. It snows, we stay home. A light rain falls on the ground, we stay home. Right? We, we don't like the seating options and or gas, we are offended, we leave the church. The Bible, uh, the pastor preaches from a Bible about, Bible about sin, we leave. The pastor talks about serving or giving and we get offended. And we can come to think that Christianity is something that I am entitled to. My salvation is something I am entitled to. And the audacity that I might have to suffer for it is outrageous. But I would ask you, is that what the Bible says? Or is that something that we've come up with in our modern American Christianity? Right? You're asking a lot of me even to get up in my pajamas and watch in the convenience of my living room and drinking my coffee. Right? That consumer mentality, this cheap grace, easy believism has an effect. And we can see it, right? As the American church tries to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, some churches' heads are spinning. Right? We may not be aware of it here because we've come through it, right? We just received eight new members. But there are a lot of churches around us that have closed. There's a lot of churches in our district and, and just our area that have closed, right? Some churches have lost 50, 75 percent, 90 percent of their people even after they opened. Churches still haven't recovered. Some churches a year later have just barely opened up. Well, if for years we have preached, come to Jesus and your life will be a bowl of cherries and wonderful. We are going to cater to you. Here are all the blessings and privileges, but we've never taught people about suffering. And so to this day, some say, hey, I'm not going to risk anything for Jesus Christ. I'm not going to suffer. I'll come when I feel comfortable. I'll come back when it suits me and the church will wait for me. I'm not going to suffer. Beyond that, for, for years, we've had churches and denominations preach exactly the opposite of Paul, right? I've heard churches preach, believe in Jesus and you will never suffer. Right? Believe in Jesus, really really believe and, and, and no more sickness, everybody's healed, believe and you will have prosperity. But then what happens when suffering comes, right? Because everyone is going to be impacted by suffering at some time in their life. What do we do? Well, they're disenfranchised, right? Either you're faulty, either I didn't have enough faith and, and I didn't believe in God or there's some sin in my life or this whole thing I've been taught all these years was a lie, but either way, I am giving up on God. But Paul writes, it was granted to you to suffer for his sake. I'll share this quote with you. The path between believing and becoming is called the way of the cross. Right, what Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And, and I wonder if we just did a, a poll of many Christians in churches and said, how many of you have actually picked up your cross and followed him? I think it would be dramatically less than the amount of people sitting in churches. But Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. The path between believing and becoming is called the way of the cross. It brings us to another word beginning with the letter B, belonging. The way of the cross is the way of belonging to Jesus. To belong to Jesus means to become identified with Him. It means ceasing to belong to the world and its pattern. To belong to Jesus is the pathway to becoming like Him. Christ in you is the way Paul captures it, Colossians 1.27. Suffering for Him is nothing to be afraid of. The world has trained us to fear this word. Jesus will show us there is actually no better place on earth. J.D. Walt says this should be our, our prayer of consecration. He says this is a prayer that we should be walking around each day saying, Jesus, I belong to you. Jesus, I belong to you. Walt once asked, why does the word suffering strike terror in us? Could it be because we belong too much to ourselves? Right, in the Wesleyan Church, one of the nice things about the Wesleyan Church is that we talk about sanctification, right? And what is that verse from sanctification to John 3.30? He must increase, but I must decrease. 
Now I know there's some in the church that think, okay, I like the I like the privileges and blessings of following Jesus, right? Sign me up for that. I like to sign up for privileges and blessings. Sign me up for healings and raining down of heaven of blessings. But I think I like to opt out of the suffering part. Right? I'll renew my membership form, but if there's a little checkbox at the bottom where I can opt out of suffering, can I do that? And the truth is, no, there isn't in your Christian life. Oswald Chambers wrote this, Suffering is a heritage of the bad, the penitent, and the Son of God, and each one ends in the cross. He says, The bad thief on Calvary was crucified, the penitent thief on, on Calvary was crucified, and Jesus was crucified. By these signs, he said, we know the widespread heritage of suffering. Now, if you have your Bibles open, flip to Philippians 3.10. Flip to Philippians 3.10. I need somebody to read that out nice and loud for everybody here. Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Thank you, Sue. That's a, that's a, a great, great verse, right? That's the verse I, I want in my finger, right? Paul writes, this is the purpose of my life. This is my goal, that I may know him. And then he draws out more detail. How does he want to know God? And he says, by the power of his resurrection. Right? That's something awesome that we'll look at when we get to it. But how else does he want to know Jesus? What does it say? The fellowship of his sufferings. Right? Paul says, I, I want to know God. That's the whole purpose of my life. I, I really want to know God and I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. That's wonderful. But he says, I also want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. And I would ask you, is it possible to know God without both of those? Warren Warsby wrote, For some reason, many new believers have the idea that trusting Christ means the end of their battles. In reality, it means the beginning of new battles. Jesus said, In this world you shall have tribulations. John 16, 33. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 12, Yes, and all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer. Vance Havner is a Christian historian. And he, he writes this book about the, the history of the church. And he talks about the Nicene Council. It was this big church meeting that happened back in the 4th century where they're trying to kind of put together the framework of Christianity. This big church meeting. And he talks about the Council of Nicaea. And he writes this, Of the 318 delegates that attended, fewer than 12 of them, 318 delegates, fewer than 12 of them had not lost an eye or lost a hand, or did not limp on a leg, lamed by torture for their Christian faith. Paul writes, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And Paul writes this in verse 30, Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now hear it. But what does it mean to suffer? You know, what it means for me to suffer and what it means for you to suffer might be very differently. What it means for an American Christian to suffer and what it means for a Christian in China to suffer might be very, very different. But if you truly want to be sold out for Christ, if you want to be used for His kingdom, then we must go through both of these two grand movements of the gospel. We must believe in Jesus Christ, believe who He is, but we must also become like Jesus. Believe in Jesus and become like Jesus. So when he calls us to serve, by golly, we serve. And when he asks us to give, we give. And when he asks us to share the gospel with our neighbor, we head out the door. When he asks us to stand firm in the faith, even when it's not popular with the world around us, we will stand firm for the faith, realizing that Christianity was not a sign-up for a pleasure cruise. On the wall in his bedroom, Charles Spurgeon had this plaque. It said Isaiah 48.10 on it. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Spurgeon said he used to look at it and he said this, It is no mean thing to be chosen of God. God's choice makes chosen men choice men. We are chosen not in the palace, but in the furnace. In the furnace, beauty is marred, fashion is destroyed, strength is melted, and glory is consumed. Yet here, eternal life reveals its secrets and declares its choice. 
do we as Christians have the conviction and the courage to pray whatever you want, Lord? I surrender all. Use me. Jesus, I belong to you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to this passage of Scripture, it does present a challenge to us. Father, week after week, year after year, we, we talk a lot about beliefs. And, and they're vitally important that we believe who you are, we believe in Jesus. It's a, the first step. And Father, it's a powerful, powerful step to believe in Jesus Christ. But Father, as we go through this passage, we see that that was never meant to be the, the last step of our Christian faith. Yes, we come to you as sons and daughters, but then you, you invite us farther in and you encourage us to become servants. Lord, help us have the courage to serve you in whatever way you call us to serve. And then you bid us even farther in and you, you say, I want you to be soldiers to defend the faith. And The sad truth is that many are ill-prepared to, to defend the faith. But Lord, you call us to have our, our conduct to be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, for many years we've lived in this country, we've enjoyed lots of freedoms, we've been handed spoonfuls of easy believism and cheap grace. But Father, you've called that we have been granted on behalf not only to believe, but to suffer for his sake. Father, whatever that means, we see our brothers and sisters in Christ in China and the Middle East and we see what it means for them to suffer. We heard the testimony from India several weeks ago of what it means to suffer in India. Lord, for us it might simply mean to get up and across the street and knock on our neighbor's door. It might mean to stand up for our faith. But Lord, you continue to work in our hearts. That he who began a good work in us will bring it into completion. Father, I pray that this passage in your word will resonate in our hearts, that it will speak to us no matter where we're at. And Lord, most importantly, we will hear you. And at the end of the day, most importantly, we will pray, Jesus, I belong to you. Give us the strength to pray that. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I ask you to stand as we close and worship together.
downstairs. They go on this benediction. The grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in his name and his power. Amen. Amen.